Good evening, good morning, good day to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Hayden Montgomery and I'm the Special Representative of the um, Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. And on behalf of the GRA and of CCAFs, which is the Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security Program of the CGIR system, we're really happy to welcome you all to this uh, Cliff Grad special, special session which is on the role of science and decision making. And we have our keynote speaker, Sir Peter Gluckman, who is uh, chair of the International Network of Government Science Advice and president elect of the International Science Council and many more things, which I'll go into in a moment. Um, this, this special session is, a, is the second in a series of webinars that um, we are organizing for the Cliff Grads awardees uh, and hosts in some cases. And these are running over the next uh, few months. This particular webinar is open to all Cliff Grads awardees from the four rounds to date, as well as the hosts from the various institutions where students take up their six month research stays, or for those who haven't yet, will hopefully be able to take up their research stays. Now, um, hopefully you're mostly familiar with, um, with Zoom by now, and in terms of the webinar format. So what a webinar format means is you won't have access to your audio and video your interaction with us in this webinar will be uh, through two main avenues. One is the question and answer module that you will be able to find at the bottom of the Zoom window, it's Q&A, and it's a little, a little button. If you toggle that, you'll be able to see the window and you can um, write questions throughout the presentation. Um, and we will endeavor to answer as many as possible um, following the talk. You can also uh, upvote questions that you like the look of, and it will bring those to the to the top of the list in order of um, priority of how many people have liked them. Um, for the questions we can't answer live, we'll perhaps answer some in written form and then follow up with you um, following the webinar. Um, the other function that is available is the chat function um, that enables people to send messages during the talk. Um, please don't write questions for the speaker there. Uh, it's impossible to, for us to manage the chat window and the, and the Q&A, but please, if you feel like chatting to, to other participants, um, make, make the most of it. Now, without further ado, um, I'm really pleased to introduce you to, to Sir Peter Gluckman, our keynote speaker. As I mentioned, Sir Peter is the chair of the International Network of Government Science Advice uh, and the president-elect of the International Science Council. And from 2009 until 2018, he was the first chief science advisor to the Prime Minister of New Zealand. He has written and spoken extensively on science policy, science diplomacy, and science society interactions. He has received the highest scientific and civilian honors in New Zealand and numerous international scientific awards. And in addition to those accolades, uh, in terms of the Global Research Alliance, um, Sir Peter was uh, a really important actor in the establishment of the GRA and the design of its governance and also uh, in, in his capacity as a scientist, uh, chairing an international panel that um, uh, helped decide on funding uh, of, of projects and an international uh, research funding mechanism that was established uh, at the outset of the Global Research Alliance. Um, I will note just before handing the floor to Sir Peter that the slides from this talk will be available at uh, the website www.informedfutures.org uh, tomorrow and many relevant papers on science advice are also available at www.ingsa.org. That was um, put into the chat window by, by Sir Peter if you um, need to get the exact web address if it wasn't clear. So um, I'll now um, pass the floor to Sir Peter. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Hayden. And it's a delight to be reconnected with the Global Research Alliance, such an important endeavor. And I've enjoyed my time working with you and the others who helped set it up. And pleased to see how much fantastic work is now going on around the world. Now, I just need to share my screen, if I can remember how to do that, and then we'll get started. Share screen. Why am I not sharing screen? Oh, there we are. What I'm going to talk about today is the interaction between science and policy. And I'm going to talk about it at a very general level 
at the level of dealing between the science community and the national government. Now, it can also, there's the same points I'm going to make can be talked about at the level of many other levels of governance from international to local. But for the, to keep it simple, I'll just uh, focus on the national government. Of course, in the time of COVID, the whole issue of how science and policy interact has come right to the top of the agenda. And in fact, I'm leading a project at the moment involving 120 countries, which is exploring how effective science advice has been in assisting governments in making their decisions about COVID, but that's for another time. Let me keep away from COVID and focus on the areas that most of you will be interested in, namely over the normative business of how science should and can inform policy making. The problem is that influencing or informing policy through evidence involves much more than simply providing policy makers and politicians with the facts that science may produce and then expecting that the policy makers will take those facts and believe that that should determine what they do. Much more goes into policy making than science alone and policy making in itself has very, very different cultures, methods, and ways of thinking, epistemologies, than does, uh, than does science. And in respect to the values that societies and every community has, there's a different relationship between science and community values and policy making community values. Science interacts with community values largely in terms of the ethics of what science has done and how it has done. Of course, policy makers are dealing with community values all the time. Policy makers in many, most countries do not want to be in, in contradistinction to what the public opinion wants. Public opinion determines much of what happens in public policy. And so there's the issue of how one reconciles the interaction between these three groups of people, the science, about the, the science system, the policy system, and society. And that's where there's increasing interest in how that interface operates. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Virtually every challenge that the government faces has a scientific component. That doesn't mean that that, that, that is recognized uh, uh, it may not be apparent to a government that science can help them in their, in their work. I remember early on when I became a science advisor talking to the Minister of Justice and he said to me, I don't quite understand why I'm talking to you other than the Prime Minister wants me to talk to you. And I pointed out, of course, that the justice system has a lot of data on how people come to be in in, 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 in interacting with the justice system and what happens to them. And by be, using that knowledge, one can perhaps reduce the burden on the justice system. But as I've just said before, science alone does not make policy. There are very ma many values and political considerations. In the post-internet world, post-social media world, we now face a further challenge that science may be trying to produce rational information about the world around us. But of course, we're now living in a world where misinformation can be used to, con to confound the opinions of both publics and of the political system. And of course, underneath all of this is the presumption that governments are more likely to make better choices when they use well-developed evidence wisely. But then we come to the issue of what is evidence, what is data, is the science robust, who defines it as robust and reliable. And they're all issues which we have to be conscious of in the way we as scientists talk to the policy community. The other point I wanna make is that the science we're talking about in general is not the science that just needs a standard technological answer. 
the, you know, governments all around the world have scientists in different ministries who are dealing with relatively technical matters. Is this drug safe? Uh, what, what, what are the transport needs of this community? How big a road should we build? They're all, <coughs> excuse me, all straightforward questions. But increasingly, and particularly in the area that you're all interested in, the science that we're doing is complex. It's often incomplete. No matter how much we learn about agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions, there'll be still more that we need to know. And the science we do is impacting increasingly on society. And of course, the stakes are high and decisions are urgent and there'll be a high values component and the values may be in dispute. And so we've seen around the world in the debates over anthropogenic climate change, the issues of some sectors of the community not wanting to engage in that discussion, not because they don't accept climate change may be real, but because the economic cost to them as they perceive it in their industry may be too high. And that's the kind of science that most science advisors are dealing with, complex science dealing with complex values and political considerations. As I said before, science policy is really determined by evidence. Policy must be informed by evidence. When you think of all the inputs into policy, there's public opinion, community values, clearly political ideology. There may be the deal that the government of the day did by electoral contract with the, with the voters. There are going to be fiscal objectives and obligations. And there may be diplomatic issues and considerations that may be in contradiction to the evidence. And so the challenge in science advice is to make sure that the science is understood and its implications are understood in the context of all these other considerations that policymakers have. And then there's the other problem. What is evidence? Those of you who've engaged with policymakers and particularly policy, politicians, will understand that for them, science is not the only form of, of evidence. For religious people, it may be their religious text, like tradition and prior belief with indigenous people is common. Local knowledge is important. And of course, anecdote and observation are, are, are what is the bread and butter of many democratic politicians. But what science is, is it's the way of trying to make objective assessments and enhance objectivity by that minimizing the role of values in the collection and interpretation of data. But that's not to say that science isn't values free. And in fact, those of you who are wanting to talk to the policymaker should recognize that the biggest value judgment you will make is about the sufficiency and quality of evidence on which you proffer advice. On the other hand, while science tries to be values free, except in that regard, the use of science by society is very values rich. And as we've talked about, just societal values can be very diverse. The other point to make is whereas science generally has reasonably clear objectives, policy making is often a lot more obtuse. Policy making in the end is fundamentally about making choices between different options which affect different stakeholders in different ways. And they each option has different consequences, many of which may be uncertain. And so virtually all policy making carries complexity, risk and uncertainty and one of the jobs in science advising is to help the politicians understanding the complexity, risk and uncertainty associated with every option. But the other problem that comes into play is the perception of risk. We as scientists may see risk largely in actuarial or probabilistic terms. Most people including politicians, perceive risk 
in terms of their, in the, the, of their various cognitive biases, and in particular their perceptions of who wins, who loses, who benefits, who loses, who pays the cost. And of course, around the world in the GMO debate, you could see that the debate was really not about the science per se, but the perceptions of gains and losses, benefits and risk burden. And for the politician, of course, there's an ultimate form of risk, which is the ballot box and their reputation. We need to say something about policymaking. If you look at any textbook on policymaking, you'll be see something that looks somewhat rational. It may be described in different ways, but it's essentially defined as a rather rational process of problem definition, option identification, selection, implementation, evaluation, etc., etc. The problem is that's absolutely mythological. The reality is policy making is always really very messy. There are lobbyists, there's policy makers, there's analysts, there's the private sector, there are political advisors, the media and the public. And then you have the complex interaction which differs in different countries in the black and the red circle, blue circle of how the executive government works and who makes the actual decisions. Are the final decisions made by the cabinet? Are they made by the president? Are they made by the legislature? All of those things affect how policy making is. And it's in that morass of a complex and rather amorphous process that one is trying to influence through science advice and find the key places at which to interact. Generally, one has two roles. One is to try and trigger somewhere in the system at actually taking the science seriously. And then secondly, it's the issue of where the decisions are made. And we'll come to that presently. And of course, when you go to the science policy community with a question, you need to be answered prepared to answer all these questions. Why do we have to do it now? Why is it a priority? Have we got an option that will meet the political and policy objectives of our government? What are the risks and to whom? And what's the political risk of doing something or not doing it? And finally, what it will cost? And those are all the proper and appropriate questions that politicians will ask. And then there's another set of problems. Last year, there were three and a half million scientific papers. Some of them were good, a lot of them weren't so good. There's a lot of science. How do you actually sort out what science matters from that science that doesn't matter? There's a temptation by many policymakers to go straight to Google, Mr. Google, and not go to the science community. We've talked about the other issues that are there and I won't dwell on them now. In general, scientists are very good at public advocacy. They can generally define the science problem well, but not the policy problem. They're not always good at finding workable, scalable and meaningful solutions. They often approach the policy maker with arrogance etc etc and let me give an example of that if we think about the whole ipcc process the climate scientists did a very good job of identifying and demonstrating anthropogenic climate change unfortunately the solutions don't lie with the climate with the scientists they lie with economists behavioral scientists social scientists political scientists energy and technology scientists, a raft of different scientists, including many of you in this room. And the challenge is not that you can, we don't understand what needs to be done. We have to find ways of doing it at workable, scalable and meaningful solutions for the policy community and the political community to pick it up. One also needs to understand that policymakers have rather limited bandwidth. They can't solve every problem all the time. They are constrained by different considerations, public opinion, fiscal, electoral considerations. They often 
don't deal with a problem until an externality comes, that means they have to deal with it. Again, if we use the pandemic as an example, governments around the world by and large should not take pandemic planning particularly seriously until after the pandemic had actually started. Despite the fact that epidemiologists have been warning for years that there'll be a pandemic sooner or later. The other thing is you cannot expect policymakers to be scientific referees. You can't have one group of scientists going to a policymaker and saying do X, and another group of policy scientists going to the policymaker and say do Y. If the science community cannot reach a consensus and move forward, that's an excuse for the policymakers not to do anything. And there's other things that I don't have time to talk about on this slide. One of the important points that I want to make comes from some thinking from a close friend of mine, Roger Pilker, who's one of the best thinkers about science advice in the world. And he wrote this book a number of years ago. It's a short book and it's worth reading if you're interested. What he distinguishes is between the scientist who is collecting and presenting data to service a cause, in fact, he's being a lobbyist for his science, as opposed to the honest broker, who's a person who, or a group of people, and it's usually a group of people, who are trying to collect, collate, interpret the data and present what is known, what is unknown, without putting a values judge, putting their own biases on what they want the policy maker to do. And you can regard the IPCC as a splendid, the scientific component of the IPCC as a good example of an organization trying to act as an honest broker. In developed countries, and I'm aware a lot of you are coming from developing countries, but the principles are the same. There are many components to an ecosystem. Obviously, universities can generate knowledge. Obviously, government scientists can generate knowledge. Uh, regulatory agency scientists can generate knowledge. The world of science is increasingly open, and so the science need not only come from one's own country. But that's not part of the science advisory mechanism. The two key components of the science advisory mechanism are knowledge synthesis and knowledge brokerage. Now, knowledge synthesis is the process of amalgamating the knowledge, as I talked about in the previous science slide, trying to identify what is known, what is not known, what is the scientific consensus, what is the knowledge saying. And the, many countries, it's the national academies that are the key players in knowledge synthesis. In New Zealand, it's the Royal Society, Te Aparangi. In Africa, there are 26 countries now that have national academies. Uh, in Europe, there's over 100 academies. These academies are groups of scientists who are often charged with trying to synthesize the evidence that can be then used by governments or by the public, depending on the situation. But knowledge brokerage is a different skill. Knowledge brokerage is the interpreter role. What is it between the science community and the policy community? How do you speak knowledge to power? How do you extract what are the questions the policymaker really wants answered by science? Now, knowledge brokers in many countries are the chief science advisor, or they may be the president of the academy, or they may be a particular government advisory board. In some countries, there's a national science and technology commission. And of course, within industry, individual ministries and agencies, you can have both knowledge brokers and knowledge synthesizers. They can be the same people, but generally they're not. Generally, the knowledge synthesizer is a large group of scientists from different disciplines integrating knowledge. And as all of you know, synthesizing knowledge across domains is a technically complex task. The chair of that group may often be the knowledge broker, but it may be that a different per person has to take on that role. And we'll come to that in a moment. Before we get there, I think it's useful just to pause and ask the question, 
what is the purposes of evidence and informing policy? And I think there are, there are this slide highlights a number of different mechanisms and purposes. The first is to help explain to policymakers a complex system so that if it's a complex system, ecological system, an environmental system, or the emission of greenhouse gases from livestock, one needs to explain the system to those people who are obvious who in time are going to have to make choices regarding it. Secondly, is to and secondly, it's to define the options that might emerge from that and to explore uh, the implications of each option. So first, if you want to address the issue of methane production from cows, one needs to first be able to explain what the system is, what do we know of the science, and then say, well, we could manipulate it in different ways. There may be options around the forage, there may be options about livestock management, there may be options around uh, manipulating the method genome of the, of, the, of the cow, there may be options around the genetics of the cow. So all of those, and there may be things about animal husbandry and the farm system itself. So each of those are options that can only be explored once one understands the system that you're looking at. And then governments often will ask science advice on a particular question or implementation issue. Obviously the issues in emergencies and crises will be different. And then there's the issues of impact evaluation, which we won't discuss now. So what are the skills of evidence synthesis? Let's break it down to evidence synthesis and evidence brokerage. Evidence synthesis first is what is the question that needs to be answered here? What is the system that we need to look at? Does it require a track? What disciplines need to be in the room? How, who needs to be in the room? As we talked about with solving the problem of climate change, you need multiple disciplines in the room. What level of detail is required? Is it going to get down to the finest detail of this particular bacteria or methanogen? Or is it that you're trying to say to the government, well, look, there are some new chemicals that may be methanogen inhibitors. We need, some, we need to do this to explore that issue. Understanding the level of detail is important because those of you who've interacted with policymakers and politicians know that they get drowned in information which is not useful to them, and then it becomes very hard for them to extract out what they need to know. And, you know, one of the skills of good science advising is knowing how to present the data very quickly, perhaps in a one minute ele elevator pitch sometimes, or certainly in a one or two, three page policy brief. Understanding uncertainty. If we don't express and acknowledge the uncertainty around what we know, then our science is probably seen to be over dogmatic, hyperbolic, and not as less likely to be uh, uh, trusted. It needs to be systematic and unbiased, et cetera, et cetera. And it really does need peer review. Now, by that, I don't mean going to the scientific journal. What I'm saying is get people who are uh, experts who have not been engaged in the actual preparation of the report or the brief to actually review it and see that you have been inclusive of what should be included and you're not over-interpreting what you're putting forward. On the other hand, the skills of brokerage are, are, are slightly different. Firstly, you need to be sure that the, aunt, the question that the prime minister or the minister or the policymaker is asking is the right question. Sometimes they think there are, you have to explore to understand what they really want to know. You need to be prepared to face the, face the public and the policymaker, because in the end, the policymaker is going to face the public anyhow. And so you might as well be prepared as well. We need, and this is the most important thing, we, a broker needs to be able to synthesize what is known, acknowledge what is not known, put caveats on what is known, present the options, communicate uncertainties, deal with the gap between what is known and what one concludes, 
understand what the implications are of each option that the policymaker might then consider and present it in a way that's appropriate to the context, depending as whether to a politician, a senior or junior policymaker. And finally, because I'm going to stop for questions in a moment, I think if you want to reach into policy, there are two things to do. Un well, several things to do. First of all, understand the context and challenges of policy making. Policy making is hard. Don't think just because you know that in one experiment A causes B, that that tells the policy maker what they must do. One needs to be sympathetic to the pressures that they are under. under. Approach them with humility and do so in a trustworthy way, which means acknowledging the uncertainties. Don't overload them and find the right time to act. Often externalities give you a chance to dive in on issues because again, as I said, policymakers lurch to problems. And when you can find the right time to meet up with them on something, have it ready to go. And the other thing to do is build relationships. If you want to deal with policymakers, you don't have to compromise your science. You don't have to compromise your integrity as a scientist, but you have to become friends to the policymakers. If you've got an interest in some issue in the Ministry of Agriculture, find out who the analyst is who's responsible for that area. Take them out for a cup of tea. Ask to have a coffee with them. Build a relationship with them so that when you're ready, find out what their concerns are. Then you can find a way of actually interacting with them. It's no different to any other area of business. You've got to build your customer before you can sell to them. And in many ways, I think the business of science advice, the science community needs to understand we need to understand what are the concerns the policymakers have and react to them. But equally, when we identify something like anthropogenic climate change as an issue, if we don't have those relationships, trusted relationships, we can't break through and get governments to take them seriously. Now, I could go on for hours about all of this. What I want to finish with is on this one slide. There's a large community of people that think about these issues. There's over 5,000 members from over 100 countries involved. This includes more than 1,000 people in Africa and 1,000 in Latin America and 1,000 in Asia. INSA works across both developed and LMIC countries. It has regional chapters in Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America and Europe. It is a forum for sharing, coordinating and networking, capacity building. We run lots of workshops around the world and there's lots of reports. And most importantly, membership is free. And on the INSA website, there is a large amount of information that expands on these topics and goes into the other topics we haven't had time to discuss. How you build the customer, how you build the relationship, the kinds of interactions one would have with them. I'm going to stop there and open it up for discussion. Thank you very much, Sir Peter. Really thought provoking. Um, it's been nice to listen to you myself. Um, so uh, just to remind everybody, um, there's the Q&A module there where you can write your questions for Sir Peter to answer. We don't see any questions there at the moment. Um, I hope it's working. If someone could just write something would be nice to reassure us and while while we do that i might ask a question um with respect to uncertainty um you touched on it in your in your presentation a couple of times could you perhaps make a comment on the challenges of dealing with uncertainty um given that science always has an inherent uncertainty in it but i guess politicians or policymakers might not be prepared to accept the same uncertainty and implementation of of a particular policy or or, or measure um, and is it possible that the unavoidable presence of uncertainty and the desire to avoid dogmatism could also lead to a more conservative science advice, which may diminish its impact in the policy arena? 
I don't think so. No, I, I mean, there, there are different views on this. And I think you've seen the debate, particularly at IPCC, over how they described likely, very likely, extremely likely in terms of different measures. But that's because of the political context of, of trying to deal with the, the different perceptions on something that is difficult to quantify. My own view is that politicians live with uncertainty all the time. I think policymakers accept that everything they recommend has spillover effects, which may be positive or negative, that they may be able to understand some, but they, they do understand the law of unintended consequences. And I think policymakers are more suspicious when you go in and say, we tell you that next year the global temperature will be X when the reality is we will never know the global temperature in 2021 until 2022, when we look back at it. So that I think that one needs to be rational about it. It's not about saying the confidence limits are so large that we, don't, we cannot give you advice. It is the probability, the most likely outcome is X, but the range of possible outcomes is from uh, from whatever becomes between X and Y. Uh, uh, I, you know, I think you can do it. And again, it's no different to the arguments over whether you have insurance. You know, you, you have insurance on the basis of probabilities. And if you believe that there's a high risk of something happening, you then choose insurance. You can say to the prime minister or the minister, or the politician, that we think it's highly likely that this will happen. We can't prove, we can't be deterministic about how large the effect is, but we know there'll be a significant effect. And of course, we saw that in the COVID story. In countries that acted early, they weren't acting on a lot of data. They were acting on the basis that it looks like given the countries who did not act early, that there's a pro high probability that COVID is going to do horrible things in our population. Therefore, we must act early ahead of time. We don't know how bad the event will be in country X, whether it will be, you know, 10,000 people, 100,000 people are infected, but we do know that a significant number will be affected and you need to act. I think it's no different in things like flood protection, environmental degradation, global warming, uh, dealing with food insecurity issues. I think the same kind of discussions are possible. All said and done, scientists are not futurists. They're not prophets. What they're doing is using the best knowledge they have at the time to give governments evidence on which governments make choices. I. I think scientists are more nervous about showing their uncertainties because they think that that may turn the policymaker off. And I think, funnily enough, you're trusted. The things I, I say when I give lectures to people who are training to be in the brokerage business, I say is there's two things you don't, you need to know to, to say up front. Prime Minister or Minister, I don't know the answer to that question. Prime Minister, science can't give you an absolute answer on that. But science can inform your decision because we know the following things. And I think if you approach them with humility, they're more likely to live, listen to you. Equally, I should say, and you know what I'm talking about, Hayden, on the other side, there are many bureaucrats who also don't know how to approach the, or officials who don't know how to approach the scientists with humility either. They go to the scientists with their mind already made up and want the scientists to confirm their prior, their prior opinion. And that's actually the hardest bit of the job. I actually find in, the, in all the work I do, it's dealing with the bureaucrat, the official, or the policy maker who's already made up their mind and that mind may be wrong on a scientific basis. And dealing with that requires a lot of diplomacy, a lot of skill and exploring why do you think that prime minister or why do you think that 
Can I take you through the argument? Would you like a brief report on that? Because I think you're wrong. But you actually can't say to those people, I think you're wrong, unless you have a trusted relationship with them. Thank you. Now we have a lot of questions. That's great. Uh, I'll go to one from one of our students. Um, Thank you for the talk. Um, and the question is, um, well, the, 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 the perception is that being able to interact with policymakers um, is very far from the position as a PhD student and, and a scientist. Um, how, how is that bridge built to shorten the distance in your view? Well, I don't think it is that, that great if you get in the right environment. First of all, scientists, not every scientist is gonna be able to talk to policymakers. Many scientists, the best thing they can do is stay in the laboratory and have other scientists be the communicator. Not everybody is a, has got the skills as a diplomat. On the other hand, around the world, more and more scientists at very young ages in their careers are learning how to engage with the policy community. They may do so through an INSA course. Uh, we'd run about 10 to 20 a year, at least when COVID's not running. They may do it by taking an internship in a government department in many countries. They may do it uh, just as I said, by building relationships with the policy community. In the United, for instance, in the United States, in many universities, there are clubs, there's science policy clubs, where students from the science faculty and students from the uh, political science departments get together and learn how to talk to each other. Most countries, you can find a way to get to policy makers, even if it's at a relatively junior level. You know, as I said, find the junior analyst who's struggling away, having to write a report for the Ministry of Agriculture on whether to, whether to, change, whether to allow, I know, some change in agricultural practice, and say, I'm interested in that question. I'll t why don't we have a cup of tea and have a, see if I can help you link to the science community that might be able to help you on the problem. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think it obviously varies across cultures, but most junior people in departments, uh, uh, agencies would love help from the scientific community. And uh, in, my, in my view, they equally are shy about how to reach out and admit they don't know where to go. And once you get that foot in the door, then moving up the ladder is quite, but if you want to do it as a profession or see it as a profession, go and do an INSA course or get a fellowship to get, or an internship in a government department to understand the intricacies of policy. Without being rude to any culture, pretend you're a German talking to a Chinese person and neither of you speaks the other language and you're trying to talk about something very technical. If you don't have an interpreter who understands not just the words of Chinese and German, but the body language and the culture of the two cultures, you're not going to be able to have an effective relationship. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. Science can do so much. We can do, offer so much to improve the sustainability agenda, the, the human development agenda, the, the environmental agenda, but we can't do it on our own. We need actually the policy makers who ultimately are the ones who make decisions about what happens. We have an obligation to make our work relevant and accessible to them. Now, some of it will be through the mechanisms I'm talking about. Some of it may be through talking to the public. The politicians in every country, even in relatively authoritarian countries, are aware of what the public thinks. Why? Not the, depending on the situation, talks, talks to the community, engagement with the community, op-eds, radio contact, to whatever is the appropriate media, get your science across, but get it across in a trusted, as a trusted communicator, and you're making a difference to how the policy community will listen. Thank you. Um, I, we have a, a group of questions that are sort of converging on a topic, so I'll just come onto them in a moment. But there was one that was there that was asking um, around specific examples of communication tool that successfully work uh, as a policy advice tool, for example, policy brief series or, or podcasts or such things. 
and whether you have any any examples that come to mind of good tools of communication well in my mind the most important tool of communication is the elevator pitch you may come across a politician at an airport or you won't at the moment in my country but uh, but 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 uh, uh, or at a railway station or in a coffee bar have you got in your pocket the four sentences that will engage the politician in your quest or the policy maker may not be a politician policy maker in the matter that of interest can you do it in four sentences your story and in those four sentences you want to first build a relationship with that person dear mr such and such i see that you've got great concerns over such and such did you know that there have been scientists in our country working on such and such would you like me to write you a brief report on it? I will do. If you do, I can get it to you in the next two weeks. In other words, build the customer by a casual relationship. Very effective. Very few scientists can do it in four sentences. But four sentences is all you're probably going to have if it's a casual contact in an airport lounge or wherever you are. Secondly, the policy brief. Now, the policy brief is basically a short document, one or two pages, never more than a thousand words, bullet pointed, very, and if you look on the web, you'll see lots of descriptions of writing policy briefs. In general, the only thing that matters in a policy brief or anything else, like in a scientific paper, is the abstract. If you don't engage them at the top of the page, in the abstract, forget it. So you've got to think through what you're trying to say, what you're trying to sell. And as I said to you in my address, frankly, in general, going to them for, with a problem without a suggested action plan doesn't help them. Politicians have problems every day of the week. It's their, what, you know, you name it, they've got, a, they've got the problem. What they want is solutions that are scalable and work for them in their lens. And what you want is solutions that are doing the scientifically right thing. That's what you're trying to align. Behind that, you may need to write lengthy reports because at some point, this is going to get into the hands, if you've been successful, of a senior analyst in a ministry, or worse, a senior analyst in the, in the Ministry of Finance, and they will want to tear you to pieces. So you will want a report written by the Academy or written by a group of scientists, which is robust, maybe quite detailed, but remember you're writing for fundamentally for lay people, not for your, to show off to your academic community. One of the criticisms I've had of many Academy reports, and I give seminars to scientific academies on this, is, they're writing them too often for their colleagues to show off how scientifically brilliant they are rather than making them accessible, jargon-free in a way that a lay person, even a very intelligent lay person, will struggle with if you're using words that are not in common usage. And I think that's a particular problem in, when the social sciences come to bear. They tend to use a lot of language, which is very hard for, for people to understand. Um, Thank you. Oh, I might just stop you there. There's a, yeah. there's a lot of questions. I'm just going to um, draw on perhaps four four questions I see, uh, and I'll let you just react to it. Okay, uh, if you're still there. Yep. Yeah, so, I'm listening. Um, so one is the the, the policy maker who's shopping for science, and that is that the policy decision has already been made, and some science is needed to back it up. And then the next question that's similar is around. Um, how do we ensure honest brokers are not ignored by policymakers to avoid future challenges and complications that maybe uh, maybe arise? Um, and the COVID example is, is, is cited there. Um, so what actions can be taken when policymakers ignore certain warnings? The next question is around um, similar lens around scientists needing to be seen as independent of government and policy and, and yet build effective relationships with policy advisors. And the final one, before I let you just think about how to <laughs> react is, um, uh, you know, the important suggestion to work close with policymakers. However, sometimes 
scientists are faced with the problem of a hidden agenda, which consists of yeah. discussing an issue, assuming that the policymaker shows some honest points, but actually has a, another interest, of, you know, hidden, hidden agenda, let's say, or another interest at heart. Um, so how do you sort of take those together and what would, you, what would be your comments? Well, let me, well, first of all, I think the problem of policy informed evidence is always there. The reality is, and the problem of having three and a half million scientific papers is that you'll be able to cherry pick some obtuse paper to support your position if you wanted to, or you will find the maverick scientist who's actually not really using his scientific credentials appropriately and is actually just supporting the political position. And we've had tragic maverick scientists like, for example, what happened in South Africa with HIV AIDS when, when President Mbeki was in power. So it's complicated. I think the protection which I would urge and which I've taken to the United Nations, it was discussed at length at the 2017 uh, Technology Facilitation Mechanism of the UN, has to be that governments develop scientific advisory ecosystems, whether it's national academies, science advisors, scientific commissions, so that there is a formal process of access. Otherwise, I think these problems will emerge and those people in those roles have to be aware of them and have to have enough maturity to fight back. It will never be perfect. And I think we're seeing examples and uh, I don't need to quote who, which countries we're looking about here at the moment where we've seen science advice corrupted for political means. That can't, that will never be helped except through the independence of ac academies in countries where universities are independent and academies are independent. I think one of the reasons for distinguishing between science, uh, between evidence synthesis and scientific and evidence brokerage is it's one of the ways that the broker may have to have one foot in each door, particularly in countries where the president of the academy or the science advisor is politically appointed, as opposed to what happens in New Zealand where it is a, a non-political appointment. Uh, I think they're, they're having the evidence since this done by independent groups such as academies from the brokerage role is a protection. But it's hard. You're actually dealing with the really hard end of this. And until countries develop good scientific advisory ecosystems, it's problematic. And that can be done even in developing countries. So there are a number of developing countries that have been developing very good science advisory ecosystems. I don't know if there's anybody in this call from Senegal, but that would be an example, or Ghana, they are examples of countries, or Jamaica, they're all countries that have done a good job, even though they're, 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 the resources are limited. Sorry, I'm mute. Another series of questions that I'm trying to bring together. Um, this is in the context in developing countries. Um, one is that, um, well, the, the, the question is, or the statement is that most of the time, especially in developing countries, scientists and policymakers are not having a good network and how, how best to bridge those gaps. Um, and another question that is similar is identifying that often uh, policymakers can last a very short time in their roles before they move on to other well, someone else replaces them. And so how do you address that when you're trying to develop relationships that last longer than maybe six months? Um, and I'll just, I'll leave it at the end and then we'll come back. Well, I think there are many things you can do. For example, I remember uh, running a course in, uh, in Africa for teaching scientists how to go and talk to parliamentarians. Invite your parliamentarian to, the, to come and visit your lab. Invite your partner, they, they always want a photo opportunity, uh, or offer to give a, a seminar to, to, to the parliament. I mean, it depends on the context. I can't, or, or to your local council, or to your village chief. All of these are part of the process. Be accessible, make yourself, but be proactive. I think that's part of the story here. Um, there's no perfect answer here, but if you're not accessible and if you're not proactive, of course you're going to not reach out. Now, of course, 
if you're working with a junior analyst who's looking to move from the Ministry of Agriculture to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as I think at least one person on this call once did, uh, 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 then A, your relationship will conti could continue in their new role, and that might be useful. Or secondly, if you've done a good job, he will leave it to his successor, and you can say to him, please make sure that, that my, your successor, had, you recommend that I have a cup of tea with him. You build it up, and most analysts are not working in isolation. They're reporting to somebody in their ministry, and if they know that you've been giving good assistance to a junior person, you'll have access at the next level. Thank you. Just one quick question um, about the International Network for Government Science Advice. Um, what are the requirements for joining? Getting on the website and registering. Just be interested in the topic. We, we have probably about a thousand professionals within it who are actually in the business of science advice. Probably about 2,000 younger people, mainly from the science community, who want to be in it. About 500 diplomats who are interested in how science is used in diplomacy, which is a particular interest of both Hayden and myself, and, and, and then, uh, again, policy makers as well. So it's quite a diverse group of people, and uh, it's been very active, particularly in Africa and particularly in Latin America, and now in Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Another question about the nexus between policy and development, so a level of development of countries. So it's getting into the real sort of tricky issues, I guess. Um, and the, the, the observation is that um, there are examples where good policies exist on the ground, but the level of development is still low. Um, what were your sort of reflections on that? Well, that's inevitable. And it's also true in, in developed countries too, that there could be good evidence and it's still not being well used. I think, I think, I can't answer that except to make another point, which is there's, there's an increasing amount of sharing going on in this community. Uh, even when I was chief science advisor in New Zealand, I would sometimes get the chief science advisor in another country, usually Ireland, to look at what I was writing, because Ireland and New Zealand had a lot of similarities in many areas, and we would share ideas. And sometimes it's through the collective interest that you can make progress. Secondly, I think that you, the, the development agencies, particularly UNDP, uh, both under Helen Clark when she was administrator, and now under Akim Steiner as administrator, are very interested in this area. And I think that they are looking, and the World Bank is also very interested. So, I, and the development banks are getting more interested. For example, the, uh, the Islamic Development Bank has the former chief science advisor of Malaysia as its advisor. So increasingly we're seeing the development agencies understanding that evidence needs to be incorporated into their development plans. And without going into details, obviously a lot of the international development agenda is set by those who have the checkbook. Another quick question. Should the scientist go to the policymaker or is it the other way around? Both. I mean, I mean, if you have something that you believe is really important, whatever it is, and you have something that you think you should bring to the attention of the policymaker, preferably if you can bring not just a problem, but at least part of the solution or a directionality to the solution, it doesn't mean you go in and say, I have found the answer. It may be saying, this is a problem which I think we can solve in the following way. They want to know about it. Particularly, they may want to know about it. You hope that you can make them want to know about it. Equally, you want to be accessible. There's nothing better than when a politician rings me, even now, no longer, I'm no longer in the ro official role, whether it's a government opposition or a Labour or, or an opposition member of parliament or if it's a senior bureaucrat or politic official, they want a bit of help. Give it to them. Uh, don't say, where's the checkbook? Give them the help and, and, and you will build relationships to the point where you can have impact on what they do. And even if they don't necessarily agree with you, 
They will respect the advice that you give as long as you don't overdo it. I mean, I'm, I would not be pestering the prime minister or the minister once a week or once every two days. You've got to choose your time. And even when I was chief science advisor to the prime minister, I would have two agendas for my scheduled meetings. If he was very busy, we would deal with the transactional matters that he wanted dealt with. But if he, if he was, and I worked for three prime ministers and they all had very different personalities, but all three of them, you could choose the day when they were not hassled and you could bring up those issues you had in your back pocket on the day that they were ready to listen. And so you've got to be, take the, op and then I was in a privileged position, but the same thing's true when you meet a member of parliament or you meet a senior official, you sometimes go out of your way to do it. I remember, again, it's a, a joke, but not a joke. I knew that our prime minister lived in Auckland and at seven o'clock every Monday morning, he would be in the airport lounge in Auckland to fly to Wellington. I would make it my point if I had something unscheduled and I really wanted to get it across to him, I would go out to the airport, to the airport lounge. I might only get two minutes with him because he'd always say, hello, Peter, and, and, and while he was having his coffee and talking to people in the lounge, I can't practice my elevator pitch in four lines. I could get over to the point. He would say, yes, of course, I want to report from you on that, Peter, at our next meeting. You've got to be, you've got to play the game. It's a, it, it, it is diplomacy par excellence. You're crossing cultures. The skill of crossing cultures is diplomacy. Thank you. So um, we're, we're pretty much nearing the, the fi final uh, questions. If you are happy to answer one, one or two more. I'm happy to keep going. All right. You're, you're avoiding me getting into a meeting about SDGs, which I've got there. All right. So this is a question which I guess is around the sort of methodology of, of policy documents. And, and perhaps in your experience, you can provide some advice here. So the observation is that in policy making doc documents, one usually finds more than one recommendation on a single problem. From your experience, are there any kind of guiding tips or guiding methodologies that may have informed the prioritization of particular recommendations over the others? That's sort of the, the taxonomy of a policy brief per se that you may be able to shed well, light on? I, I, I learned early on to avoid the word recommendations. I don't think the role of a science advice mechanism is to recommend a particular mode of action. Now, some people do think it is, and they're the science advocates, they're the advocates, that being the science advocate, issues advocate I talked about before. I always felt the best way to approach it was, government, you have the following options. These are the, this is what are the implications or what I understand or see to be the implications of each option. Now, by writing those out, it becomes pretty obvious which options are acceptable and not acceptable. And obviously you will order them so the most acceptable ones are at the top of the list. But you cannot, but I think if you want to be trusted, don't be too overt an advocate. Of course, we all know what we want them to do. Of course, we want them to you know, reduce fossil fuel uh, use or whatever it is on the particular issue you're talking about, or you want them to introduce genetically modified crops, or you want to do something else. But you don't go into the values domain. The second you go into the societal values domain, you're actually taking the job away from the policymaker. And if there's anything that gets the policymaker upset and wants them to get rid of the scientists, is if they think you know their job and are doing their job for them. You're far best to say, this is what we know. This is what we don't know. These are the options. These are the implications of each option. Now, it's for you, policymaker, to consider all those values domains of financial, public opinion, diplomatic, whatever, and recommend to the prime minister or the minister which option to take. But if you go too far, and I've seen this time and time again all around the world, you get too far into the policy making space and they think you're an arrogant bloody person. We don't need you. I can go to Wikipedia. And so I think the important thing is 
remember what your role, remember what's the role of the policymaker. Your role is to provide the evidence and interpret the evidence. Their role is to look at the values domain and it's for the politician to finally make the decision. And if you go that way, you will have a much happier time with the policy community than if you try and take their job from them. Very good. I might just ask one more, uh, unless there's a massive vote on some of the questions there. How can scientists become better at defining the policy problem? Because scientists are good at defining the science problem. So is there any kind of way that that could translate into the policy arena better? Well, number one is the skills of policy making are distinct in their own right. And unless you're going to go through a whole public policy training, you're not going to become overnight an independent expert. But what I think is the, and we haven't really talked about this, I think the big skill that I think is really important is making the question and the answer aligned. Sometimes you have to sit there with the policymaker or the analyst, whoever it is, and say, what is it you really want to know? Are you asking the right question? Is the question you want to know what the level of this uh, chemical is in the ground? Or is it you want to know whether to use the chemical in the first place? Or are you trying to do something else? And it's, and a lot of the time I've spent, before you write the report or even start doing the work, is trying to align what is it that they really want to know? And then what, what disciplines do I need to bring to the table to answer the question? And that's what I think you're asking is, engage in that question before you do the work. Think it through, drill them what you really want to know and why and understand the question right. I think one of the tragedies of many National Academy reports is they never get read or used because they're not really answering the question the policymaker really wants to know. Often I find the policymaker actually doesn't really know how to verbalize that question. So you sit down and talk to them. Okay, I'm gonna ask one question and that's to be the close and I want you to answer it in three words. Oh shit. <laughs> And I want those words to be um, defining the sort of characteristics of the scientists um, and thinking about our audience being PhD students. And as they move their, through their careers, um, what sort of characteristics or behaviour should they have to make them uh, most effective in bridging that gap between science and policy? Trusted, high integrity and humble. These three words. Very good. Hope everyone heard that. Right, I will call this to a close. Um, I have found this personally very interesting. I thank you very much for your, your generosity and your time. It's uh, now quarter past 11 at night here in New Zealand and you said you have something else to go to. So yeah. we really do appreciate you joining us. Um, if, if we could do rounds of applause on Zoom, I'm sure there would be a very loud one. Um, there's been a lot of positive chat and comments coming through. So I know the audience has very much appreciated your insights and, and I certainly has, have as well. So, so thank you very much. So I have the slides up on my website tomorrow. And as I said, look at the Inter website. You'll find lots of stuff written by me and many other good thinkers in this field. So thanks, so, Aidan. No, and no. good luck with, the, with all the work that everybody in this whole exercise is doing. I mean, this, this work around food production, food security, and reducing greenhouse gases is one of the most important bits of science that's going on in the world. So you're all in the right space. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Um, please remember to tune in for the next session for the, the webinar series. Um, Hazel perhaps could remind us when, what that one is and, and when that will be, um, but I'm sure there'll be a, a series of emails coming through that will remind you to register as well. So uh, once again, thank you very much for your time. You. Anything, anything, Hazel? The next session is the thematic student session on integrated systems, and that's open to all students from all four rounds. Great. Excellent. Any questions or comments, please remember you can just email us as well at the, uh, at the Cliff Grads address and we'll endeavour to answer your questions as well. Thank you very much.